Welcome to TEN, the Tenant Experience Network. I'm your host, David Abrams. In this episode, we are connecting with Josh Berger, Vice President at Norman Bobro & Co. In this episode, we learn about Josh's career journey from marketing to commercial real estate, where in the beginning, he moved back home to do the daily grind with zero income. Josh shares his views on the return to the physical workplace and on the Manhattan real estate market. I love how Josh expressed his learned belief that there is no one size fits all and that every situation is unique. Savvy landlords see that helping their customers to attract and retain tenants is now a priority. While this phenomenon began pre-pandemic, it is certainly a bigger part of the conversation today. The question is, what is really most important to tenants? Ping pong tables or conference centers? We both agree that COVID has awakened the real estate industry and that we can't do business the way we always had. Josh really impressed me with his commitment to helping people, particularly during the pandemic, with his position that it is never about the commission. We're excited to share this podcast with you, so be sure to subscribe to 10 so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome Josh to the show. I'm really glad you could be with us today. How are you? I'm good, David. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you reaching out and looking forward to the chat. Absolutely. Um, so I'm really curious. Tell us about your journey to your current position role. How did you get started in this business? Sure. So um, I actually had no background in real estate whatsoever. Uh, my parents are both immigrants and uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I studied marketing in college and, you know, essentially marketing in real estate if real estate sales at least are very very similar so i was interviewing at a number of different marketing places in my junior year of college and a buddy of mine said hey my brother's doing really well for this guy norman why don't you go have a chat with him i said i have no network i have no family i have no family money <laughs> you know right. I'm, I'm starting this for myself and he said i said i'm going to embarrass you he said don't worry about it just go have a conversation so i went to sit with norman Prior to that, I had met with various different marketing companies who had told me you could make $100,000 a year, which obviously it's not an insignificant amount of money, but for the life that I wanted to live and for my goals, it just wasn't sufficient. So when I sat down with Norman, he said to me, the sky is the limit. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, that's great. The second part of his sentence was, but you're not going to make money for a year. Mm -hmm. Can you afford that? Mm -hmm. uh, I said, no, I can't. You know, I, I've been I've been grateful to have been raised by parents who put a roof over my head, put food on the table, paid for my way through college. But, you know, I don't really have, you know, much many laurels to rest on. Uh, so I called my parents and I said, hey, I know you just put me through college, but I'm looking at this 100 percent commission job. What do you think? Uh and they were wonderful. They said, you know, if that's what you want to do, we'll support you. And so it wasn't support you like you can go to Miami for spring break. It was, hey, come live in our guest room. We'll pay for your New Jersey transit bus ticket. We'll pay for your PB&J for lunch. And that's right. it. Right. So and and it was wonderful. You know, I was I was grinding every day, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So that's kind of how I got into the business. Totally, um, you know, by accident, quote unquote. Uh, right. And then and then it just kind of evolved from there. Well, first of all, three things. One, I also have a marketing background, so uh, we have that in common. Um, two, I think your story about not planning on getting into real estate is absolutely the most common theme we've heard from almost every single guest, no matter how experienced, how senior, how, I mean, it, it is just seems to be the story of huh. real estate. Um, and three, I just love the, the fact that your parents um, embraced and supported you, but, you know, again, didn't write you a blank check, made you work. Um, but but gave you the support that you're needed. So uh, a really wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that yeah, with us. Sure. Um, so why do you think, you know, although real estate perhaps wasn't your destiny, particularly, you know, initial thoughts out of college, why do you think you were so uniquely suited for this opportunity? What has helped you to become successful? Sure. Um, great question. I think I think there's there's two elements to that. The first element is like drive and hustle. You know, that's something that is just so important in, in real estate and brokerage. And if if you're not driven and you don't have hustle, you know, you, there's not much behind it. I mean, I've I didn't know this. Until, I didn't 
accept this about myself until reflecting much later but my parents told me stories about when i was a kid and you know you i would be shoveling driveways for money because i wanted to buy a hockey stick that my parents couldn't afford you know they could pay 50 i wanted 100 i had to work for it right or you know they they sent me to summer camp one year because they saved up money and they came to bring um uh, a picnic and they had a watermelon for dessert they said we ate half of the watermelon do you remember what happened to the other half I said, no. They said, well, you sold it. Um, <laughs> now, now to me, I didn't have money for a canteen. It wasn't really right. a choice. This is the only option. So that's that's the first part, which is I think I have this in, innate hustle uh, within me. Uh, right. The second thing is that, again, let's, let's call it three parts. The second thing is that uh, I really love people. And I really love understanding people and how they think. Again, with the marketing background, marketing is really just understanding how people think. It's psychology, right? right. Uh, most sales are like that. Um, and so I have, I have an understanding of people. I enjoy getting to know people. Uh, and that's a, that's a whole other element. And then the third thing is really that I, I enjoy guiding a process. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy quarterbacking the show uh, because it involves, you know, each of the first two things as well. Um, but it, but it, it enables me to kind of say, hey, what's our target? What's our goal? How do we get there? Who needs to do what in order for us to get there? And how do we communicate effectively through that process? Right. Very good. Um, you know, there's a lot of commentary around the return to workplace and there are some extreme opinions being expressed, um, often confrontational, sometimes polarizing. Um, the team and I at Hilo believe that everyone needs to live and work in the world as it is right now. Um, and I think that CRE industry and employers, we can't continue projecting into the future as to re when the world re will return to you know that old normal. Uh, yeah. Perhaps living in a world with COVID, uh, not post, with is the new normal. Correct. I'm just curious, you know, what do you think that means for the commercial real estate industry? How can buildings continue to be an important um, part of a workplace ecosystem? Sure. Listen, I think it's a great question, and it's obviously something that's in the forefront of everyone's minds these days. Right. What what you see the most, as in as in a lot of news or opinions, you see the two extremes, right? You have P and and it's funny because I I posted something on LinkedIn uh, the other day just to kind of test the waters and see what people are feeling about this because TikTok just mentioned that they're going to have people coming back to the office two days a week, and then right. we'll see, and they're requiring it. So, man, the vitriol. On, on, right. on LinkedIn, you know, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to see other people's opinions. Um, I fall smack in the middle. Right. I don't believe that either extreme is correct. That's my perspective in life in general. Um, yeah. There is nothing that is black and white. And obviously in saying nothing, I'm obviously, you know, either way. Um, yeah. And and it's about it's about a balance. And the comments that came back to me on the LinkedIn post were fascinating. Somebody literally just wrote back, you wish and I'm thinking to myself, you know, you don't even, you don't know who I am. You don't know what's going on. And then I looked at what their job is, their job position, and they're a coder for a tech company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, so, you know, my response was, I think that there are certain positions that will be sufficiently capable of doing their job very well remotely. Right. But I, but I think that that's only going to be about a 15% shift. Right. Which, again, in a market like Manhattan, a 15 percent shift is drastic. Right. The market is over 550 million square feet. Right. But I think the most important thing is to understand that companies need to look internally, say, to the, say who needs to be in the office, who doesn't. Right. For me, I've had a unique experience in that 90 percent of my clients have actually increased their office space footprint since COVID. Wow. Right. And okay. and I and, and and I'm aware I really try not to generalize my experience to the world. Right. All I know is Manhattan. Right. I can mm -hmm. tell you office space in Manhattan. Right. You know, that's that's all that I know. And and yeah. and and even all that I know is I'm only I'm only doing this 15 years. Right. Norman, my mentor, is doing this 45 years. You know, what do I really know? Right. right. Um, but what I have found is that there are certain groups of, of, of jobs within an organization that do much better when you're in person. Um, salespeople enjoy the back and forth, bouncing ideas off of one another. Um, if there's a mentorship program, regardless of what it is, when you're sitting next to someone, it's going to be easier to have a conversation or a discussion. Um, all of that being said, there are there, I have two or three clients who have completely given up their office. Right. I have two or three clients who are really set up from a technology and, a, and from a workflow standpoint to function well remotely. They have, so, so and then they said, hey, we don't need an office anymore. Totally fine, right? And so I'm not going to be here saying office space will be office space, and it always was, and it always will be. What I will say though is that people are people, right? And we are, and we are tribal. And when you have positions like coding or certain things like that, where you have your headphones on, the lights off, and you're sitting in front of a computer typing away, 
you might not you might not need to be in the office every day or even at all. Um, but when it comes to mentorship, sales, um, even st strategic planning, um, I can tell you that as much as I love this Zoom, if you and I were sitting one on one together, it would yeah. feel very different, right? 100%. 100%. Um, so I think we're seeing a significant shift. I think the 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 bottom line that I'm seeing, though, is that there is no one size fits all. I've seen myriad situations. And the thing that I've learned is that every situation is different. And people in the news and people with their opinions want to speak about generalizing their experience to the world. And that's just not the case. Um, again, like I said, I did I did an expansion for a client of mine who was in 8,000 feet. I put them in 45,000 square feet. That's a significant expansion. Right. And right. their comment their comment to me was, and I, this happened again yesterday on a space tour with a financial services client. They said to me, we are now competing with the Goldman Sachs of the world for employees, mm -hmm. right? If we don't have an office where they feel special and they feel good, which means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, they're not going to come in or they're not even going to consider our our proposal. Not to mention the fact, I, I know I'm, I'm going off on this, but this is no, my thing these days. It, you're, it's, it's, really, it's really great stuff. It's great perspective. I'm totally with you about not yeah. taking, you know, being in the middle and, and seeing the best of both worlds, the best of both sides. Right. Um, so, he, so you even look at the commute, right? That's one of the classic things that everyone talks about. I'm wasting two hours. I'm not getting paid for my commute, blah, blah, blah. That's the one side. The other right. side of my friends are my friends that are like, I have three kids at home. God, that hour on the train is so yeah. peaceful. Yeah. Or I have friends who aren't married who don't have kids. You know, I just like sitting and watching an episode of something on the train when I'm going home, yada, yeah. yada, yada. Let's so, a podcast. That's cool. listening to a fantastic yeah. podcast made by David Abrams. <laughs> you know, we don't know. Um, but but so so I think so much of it comes down to a personality type. Are you the type of person who's going to complain about everything? Or are you the type of person that's going to say, hey, we got to adjust and I'm going to make the most of what there is? Right. OK, a lot of great insights there. I, I, I have to catalog them all. But um, you, you, you touched on one point about, you know, attracting and retaining talent. And so part of my question is, yes, I think employers are going to have to compete, you know, obviously um, that much harder. But do you think buildings, the building, the building owner, the building developer, the building property manager, do you think they have any responsibility to help employers attract and retain the best talent? Is there anything that buildings can do to support the employers within their buildings? I love that question. You know, I think I wouldn't say it's the building's responsibility, but what right. I'll say is that if you're a savvy landlord, you take it on as your responsibility. Right. 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 Um, yeah. I think that you've seen a shift, a tremendous shift, even pre-COVID. And this is what people don't understand. Even pre-COVID, there was a massive shift of landlords reinvesting in their buildings to create more tenant amenities. Right. This happened pre-COVID. A lot of a lot of things that happened pre-COVID, you know, it's like, oh, it's because of COVID. No, let's take, take let's take context. People love the boogeyman. They love blaming everything on COVID. No, right. things that things were happening beforehand. Um, when you're looking at older office product in Manhattan, again, that's all I know. When you're yep. looking at office product in older office product in Manhattan, they were redoing their buildings to create amenity centers, right? Buildings like, for example, a 590 Madison that would always just attract tenants because they were a great building. They took an entire floor, created a tenant gym, created parking spaces downstairs. Um, and again, it's all going to depend on the type of business that you're in and the type of employees that you have. Meaning an amenity center on Park and 51st is going to be very different than an amenity center at, let's call it, you know, Park Avenue South and 25th Street. Right. right. You're, you're pulling from from different from different types of people. Um, and so buildings can do many things. But what I will say, and this is an interesting thing. Um, on the one hand, you want to be in a good space to attract employees. But on right. my tour yesterday with my client, they said to me, yeah, amenities are great, but we're, we're not having people come in to hang out and play. You know, if, if there's something I'll give you I'm not going to tell you which buildings they were, but there were two different buildings right. with different amenity centers. One amenity center had like a PlayStation and a pool table and, a you know, a, you know, ping pong table, all these different yes. things, right? Yes. The second building had had a, a place where you could rent out conference rooms and had right. a, and had a rooftop terrace that had catering for the building. Right. Right. I think you can imagine which one I, appealed more to my client. I get it for sure. Right? Yeah. And so it's a so it's a question of how landlords are amenitizing their buildings. Uh, the ones that are smart are doing things and talking to their tenants. It, it's not tricks or bells and whistles. It's to your point. I think you were trying to illustrate. It, it, it's it's amenities that actually enrich the experience and actually help um, make people more productive, make people happier, make, make people better able to do their work that they're doing. So I, I, yeah. I think that's a great insight. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're not all going to come back for food or a ping pong table. Um, the, 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 you know, that, that might be some short term um, strategies or, or tactics. 
but that's not really sustainable. Um, right. You know, you touched on a number of, of points and you spoke about people. And, you know, our belief is that the pandemic really helped recalibrate the market and accelerated that recalibration so that the industry, commercial real estate owners and operators understood that really buildings are just places for people. The real asset are the people, not Correct. the building. You know, we, we've lived through a period of time where buildings were relatively empty, sure. not much of an asset. Um right. So as a result, we believe, and obviously, um, you know, given the space that we are in, in all in, around tenant experience, workplace engagement, we believe that that is becoming uh, the new differentiator and is now helping to drive real estate decisions in some cases, more so than the historical determinants such as location and class, that people are looking for that conference center or that rooftop patio um, right. or the fitness center or maybe a quiet room, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just curious how you think we will go about creating, defining the best customer experience for tenants now and in the future? Sure. It's a great question. And, and I think that it will, I think it'll vary by industry, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are certain industries that have different workflows. There are certain industries that have different um, way, attract different types of people who think in certain ways, right? right. And so in, in a certain sense, and again, this is nothing new. I'm not saying anything new. You know, in, in the past, you've had, oh, to the, you know, Empire State Building did a $400 million investment to create a tech campus right. within right. the building, right? This is not new, right? So I personally believe that COVID might have accelerated it, but it actually didn't have anything to do with, with the mentality. I think landlords were more were aware of this pre-COVID, and it, like you said, it did accelerate it. Um, right. But 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 I think that things will continue to shift. And the other thing that 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 people are kind of touching on are is the economy, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, you know the 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 joblessness is very low, right? The employment is very high, um, but the reality is is that we are facing economic headwinds. That's right. the truth, right? And right now, the the employee is the one. Oh, I'm the man. At the end of the day, your paycheck is cut by a company or a CEO. Right, right. I don't believe that many people will have the backbone to say, if you make me come into the office, I'm quitting. I think that's that's hyperbole. I think that's that's something that has been discussed, you know, mentioned before when the economy was great. I think it's 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 la la land. Um right. I I think that he, and here's the other thing. If it if if a if a CEO only wants his or her employees in the office two days a week. She or he still has to sign a lease for the entire space all right. the time. So right. at a certain point, there's going to be a calculation made of are you delivering? Are you not? Are our numbers down? Not that there's necessarily a correlation, but you're going to make that. There's a correlation, but it's not necessarily causation. Right. Mm -hmm. But a CEO might say we need to shift this in order to you know bring our numbers up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it, the answer is I don't know. The answer is it will shift. And, and, I, and to go back to what you mentioned earlier about a new normal. Yes. Right. Every day is a new normal. Right. And I and I think to your point, things it did, you know, kind of wake the real estate industry up. COVID did yeah. uh, into saying, hey, we, we can't do business as we always have. And again, real estate is a really tough industry to disrupt. Right. right. Because it's based on such you know serious things. And that's why, in my opinion, a lot of the CRE tech that's coming up. Meh, yep. meh, you're not doing much. You're, you're taking something and packaging it differently. And say it, but it's the same thing. Why? Because the essence of the real estate business is still solid. Right? right. To your point, though, the buildings are filled with people. Right. Right. So if you can't attract the people in, you're not going to have a full building, which means that you can refinance your building, which means you can't buy more buildings. Right. So it's 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 a kind of a, you know, a cause and effect type thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, my personal feeling is that we shouldn't I, I don't think we should be mandating uh, people to come back. I don't think we should be prescribing when they come back. I think what we want to do is create a culture and an experience that actually invites people, that it, that is actually a place that people want to be. Um, and I agree. Give them and gives them purpose and perhaps d differentiated purpose from, you know, working at home one day or working from their summer home another day. Um, and I, I think, and yeah. I think then buildings will win the day again. I, I think there, there is enough value and benefit, but I think it can't be forced. I agree with you. Um, I, in an ideal world, I agree with you wholeheartedly. But what I've learned through my experience is that very few businesses are run properly. Very right. few businesses are mission driven. Very right. few, very few businesses look at what how their employees are feeling. Not in reality. I mean, I don't mean how they look, how they feel. I mean, really building a business around employees. Right. That's part A. Part B is I think a lot of people lack enough lack self awareness and lack the ability to decide what's right for them. Right. Meaning, meaning if I'm working from home and I'm comfortable because I like sitting in my pajamas on my couch, I might say, I'm doing just as good of a work. You might not be doing good, just as good of work. 
period. Right. And so you might need your employer to say, hey, get your ass to the office, right? right. You might need that. Um, I can tell you personally, I can't stand working fully remotely, right? right. I, I'm a people person. I love talking. I, I, I'm with you. You know, I, and, I'm totally with you. And I also, I also run the, 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 the broker development program and the, and the internship programs. I can't give those lessons over Zoom. Right. I can't do it. You know, I was I had a chat with somebody recently who said to me something like 60 percent of what you say is is this is, is given across by your body language. Right. Right. You can't yep. even see you can't even see my legs. Right. Yep. You can't yep. even see anything, anything below here. Right. So how, how do we how do we create a shift? It's going to be challenging. And I think I a lot of these articles and a lot of people are talking about idealism. Doesn't, the world doesn't work that way, right? The reality is that most small to medium-sized businesses are focused on one thing, making a profit. That's it, right? And I agree with you. If they want to make the most profit, you build an organization that supports your employees, invites them back where they feel valued and they feel collaborative and they feel the value of collaboration. Absolutely. But that's a very challenging thing to do, especially when you have the inertia of the company and the, the momentum that's been going for so many years the same way. Right. Well, I think time will tell. I think I think we're fundamentally on the same page yes. for sure. Um, I think you have also, you know, an insight uh, given your relationships into the industry um, that obviously gives you, uh, you know, a, a unique vantage point. Um, let's take a short break, and we'll be right back. Sounds good. This episode of Ten is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a rapid deployment workplace engagement platform for the hybrid world that enables building operators to connect to their tenants, whether they're at work, at home, or anywhere in between. We are in the midst of a seismic shift in the evolution of the workplace. Now more than ever, it's clear that the most important asset of a building is the people. Commercial real estate leaders recognize that tenants and employees want new kinds of spaces, services, and amenities to support having the flexibility to work from anywhere. Workplace engagement solutions that connect hybrid working people to buildings no matter where they are have become a major differentiator as buildings compete to retain current tenants and attract new ones. Hilo empowers building operators to meet this challenge. To learn more about Hilo and schedule a demo, visit HiloApp.com. We're back with Josh Berger, Vice President at Norman Bobro. Thanks again for having me. My pleasure. Uh, living through a pandemic is very challenging. Let's at least agree on that. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. But, but it's also, I believe, now it's provided us an opportunity to be better, do better, and build something better. We can no longer use COVID as an excuse. Um, and believe me, it happens. And I see it every day. It drives sure. me crazy. <laughs> um, can you share any details about your business or some part of your business yeah. that you're reimagining or rethinking to reflect the reality of where we are today? Yeah, you know, I think my business is very similar than as to how it was pre-COVID. But what I will say is the perspective that it reinforced in me is the concept of giving and helping, right? Okay. Um, for for a year, ninety percent of my deals fell off a cliff. No right. one had any idea what was happening. Yet I was busy every day all day speaking to clients updating them here's what my experience is with this tenant here's my experience with that landlord and it drove home the point even more about how valuable relationships are and how valuable it is to be a resource you know and and i remember you know i, I was I'm, I'm now married a year i was dating my wife at the time right and she said to me she goes you know it's so fascinating you're busy all day but there's no deals happening and she wasn't saying it in a, she wasn't saying it in a negative way she was saying how it's fascinating how i'm having so many productive conversations helpful conversations and she said so she said you're not getting paid on any of this are you i said no i work on commission she said so why are you doing it i said because i want to be a resource to people and so fast forward two years I cannot tell you, I can't even count how many referrals I've gotten or P, or deals that I've done from people that I've helped through the pandemic. And right. so it, re, it reinforced this concept of relationships, be a resource. And, and, and this is something that Norman told me when I first started in brokerage and it made zero sense to me. He said, it's never about the commission. Yeah. Now, how baffling is that when you're a kid without a pot to piss in, you know, coming, coming out of college, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and now I get it. You know, if you don't make it about the commission. So all I'll say is it reinforced the concept of making sure to be in touch with your people, be a resource to them. And it also, for me, reinforced my love of being in the office personally, right. personally. Sure. I mean, I love sure. coming in. We have we have meetings where we'll just discuss ideas and and, and, it's, and it's just different. Uh, we just released a, another episode with Stephen Rotter, uh, um, vice chair at JLL. 
Sure. Um, be sure to check it out because he spoke a lot about relationships. Yeah. And, uh, I, and and so there's definitely a, a symmetry, a synergy uh, yeah. in your team. So de definitely check that out. I think you'd enjoy it. I certainly uh, will. Yeah, for sure. Um, our closing speed round, an opportunity to get to know you, the you, a little bit more. And I actually have a, a question, an unscripted question. I, maybe I'll start with it. Um, well, I, I did note that there's a creative side to you um, and a lot of different creative ways in which you uh, express that. Uh, I'm just curious if you can share a little bit about maybe your one or two of your favorites. I think photography. Um, yeah. but give us a little insight there. Yeah. So, so, so my my favorite creative thing to do is brokerage. Um, <laughs> pe pe people don't understand it, but 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 brokerage is an art, right? Sales okay. is an art. Marketing is an art. But I'm I'm okay. just kidding. That I'm just kidding with that. Yeah. Um, no. So so my favorite thing to do. Uh, so I started initially uh, doing street art and graffiti when I was younger. Um, wow. I I, I uh, this is by the way this is all in the last five years. Um, right. I was I was married when I was younger. I got divorced. Uh, okay. When I was when, when I got divorced, uh, I kind of went through a self exploration. Um, right. I knew that I could throw myself into real estate, make a lot of money, but I wanted to figure out who I was uh, before right. kind of doing that. And so I started with graffiti and street art, and I met a whole world of underground artists. Speaking of relationships, wow. who who supported me, and then I made a transition from from that to more fine art with acrylics on canvas. Um, mm -hmm. I also created a whole series where I would take do photography. I would take pictures of of parts of the city, uh, mm -hmm. and then I would print them on canvas, and I would mask off the buildings and then spray paint to highlight the negative space, right? The different uh -huh. shapes that, that pop out. Yeah. Um, and then about uh, two years ago, I decided to get into music. Um, oh, wow. I just bought like a MIDI keyboard. I plugged it into my Mac and just started messing around. And again, I met a lot. Of, I met a lot of people who were very uh, just great people, wonderful, talented musicians who kind of took me under their wing. And we've created a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of different things, uh, which is a good segue. Actually, I'm about to launch a pro my my new website. Uh, okay. I've, been, I've been working on it for like six months. <laughs> Give it a plug. Get a plug, you know. Uh, and it's it, the, the the URL is very surreptitious. It's iamjoshberger.com. Um, okay. So uh, and it kind of goes through a holistic perspective of showing who I am and, and how everything kind of relates together. But cr the creative part is very important to me. Uh, forget about what I'm creating, but it's a huge outlet. Uh, it's very a place cool. for me to turn my brain off. So that was, yeah. a, long that was a long answer to your question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, but I'm glad I asked and, and thanks for sharing. Okay, back to the script. Can you share yes. one way in which the pandemic has changed your outlook on life? Absolutely. I mean, uh, again, I wouldn't say changed. Um, I would say reinforced. Uh, and I, and I, had, I had this conversation with my therapist during COVID. Um, I said to her, everyone's freaking out about stuff. Why am I not freaking out so much? Like, mm -hmm. wh what's wrong with me? And she said, Josh, you understand that in your business, you're constantly planning two to three years out. Right. So this is really no different. And right. I was like, oh, that's fascinating. But what it did is it reinforced two things. Number one, the value of relationships and helping people and yeah. doing things, you know, just because it's the right thing with no right. expectation. And the second thing is family. Right. It, it made me really. And I mean, since the pandemic started, I make a concerted effort to see my family at least every other week. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have grandparents who are alive. I right. uh, see my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, net nieces, nephews, um, yeah. because I'm just there's I could die tomorrow. You know, yeah. it could be over tomorrow. And, you know, I want to make sure that I did everything that I could to be the best family member, be the yeah. best broker, be the best friend, be the best husband, you know, and so. Well-rounded, well-rounded. Good for exactly, you. Exactly, exactly. Good, Good for you. Is there a travel destination that you miss most? Um, You know, that, that one's hard. You know, I, I'm. this is not really fair because I was just in Mexico at a resort relaxing, okay. but I miss it already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, we've uh, fun, I, we, we, we've been. Exactly. We've, we've, been, we've been very lucky. You know, the last couple of years we've traveled a lot. Um, and so we've been kind of getting our kicks out because we, we you know, we didn't do it during for, you know, 20, 20 and 21. And so right. we, we've, been, we've been all over the place. We were in L.A. We were in Mexico. We were in Saratoga Springs. We're doing Italy at the end of the summer. So I oh, can't great. complain. I can't complain. I'm very excited. Yeah. Good for you. We'll talk Italy offline. Perfect. Uh, anything new on your bucket list that you'd like to experience? Um, hmm. That's a good one. Um I don't, you know, I had a couple of answers in my mind, but I would say, I would say uh, a safari in Africa. Okay. Um, my family's from Cape Town and my, my parents always talk to me about, you know, their experience there. And, and, and it's definitely a bucket list item. I don't know when we'll get there because you need a good couple right. of weeks. Right. Um, but, but that's that definitely okay. a bucket list item. Yeah. All right. That's a big one. Uh, what's your favorite technology that is new to your life? Uh, this little thing called TikTok. Um, <laughs> okay. 
so as part of this whole like branding experience that I do, you know, with the website building and the LinkedIn, you know, uh, presence and everything like that, um, I've decided to make an Instagram account for my work and then also a TikTok. Uh, it's a foreign world to me. Um, I'm grateful to have clients who are very active in the space. So they're kind of showing me the ropes, but it's scary. And, you know, you're doing it wrong. But, you know, I think it's a great lesson of, you know, even if you don't know how to do something, just keep trying, surround yourself with mentors and people who can teach you and who knows what can happen. Hey man, that 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 goes back to when I started this podcast. You think I knew what 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 to do or how to do it? So you just jump right in. Um, right. What is Josh's personal choice for days spent in person with your colleagues versus working from anywhere? Great question. Um, I'm I think I'm probably amongst the majority of saying three days a week in the office, two days a week at home. Okay. Um, you know, I think that. I say that, but I'm in the office five days a week. You know, right. um, but but the reality is that you know for the summer because the, the summer in my industry right. tends to be slower so mondays and fridays yeah. i can i'm happy to work remotely mm -hmm. and, and and do my thing or take an extra day on a, on a trip that we're taking during the year i mean i'll just be totally frank i mean i'm very very busy all the time i schedule yeah. my days very very tight and so i would prefer to be in an office in my space in my and also the other thing is i'm i'm in a comfortable office right i have my right. own office you know so that that plays a role um, sure. but but i will say that i do enjoy spending some time with flexible with flexible time but i thoroughly enjoy being in the office bantering with people and again i'm an extrovert i mean right. if you couldn't tell um, really really shocking. Yeah, sh shock and surprise <laughs> um so i get a lot of fulfillment from that so from that standpoint it's almost selfish for me yeah. being in the office it's okay. almost has nothing to do with business you know right. i love people and the thing is also like mm -hmm. i'm not sitting in my office all day like yesterday i was out on a space tour and then right. i had a client for lunch and then right. i would share somebody else's space so so for me being in the office is vastly different than most people 100 percent, and that's the way it should be regardless of what we're doing it, it should offer that kind of variety in terms of our activity it shouldn't just be sitting at a desk because guess what you can do that at home right um, correct so so there you go. Yeah. Uh, listen, Josh, I am so glad we connected that we, first of all, that we met, we connected. Yeah. Um, we've been able to enjoy this conversation today. I look forward to many more with you. Uh, I wish you continued success uh, on my next trip to New York. Uh, I guarantee you and I will be meeting up. Um, and I look forward to that. I look forward to connecting in person. Wonderful. Thanks again so much. Thanks so much again for having me. Um, when you're in New York, definitely hit me up. I'll show you, I'll show you some good, some good spots for some uh, good restaurants. We'll have a good time together for sure. I love it. Thanks so much. All the best. Take care. All right. Thanks so much, David. Bye now. Bye-bye. I want to thank Josh Berger for joining me on this episode of 10 and for contributing to the global conversation around buildings being part of a robust ecosystem that can help to build great companies and that they are vital in the effort to cultivate and support great people and teams. The future of the workplace will likely take many forms and we will continue to explore what that looks like together. Subscribe to 10 for more conversations with leading CRE industry professionals and experts who all have something to say about tenant experience and the future of the workplace. We love hearing from you, so if you enjoyed this episode of 10, please share, add your rating, and review us through your preferred podcast provider. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live. Thank you.